Hello, everyone, and welcome to the final point of the final science of 2021, coming to you from the University of Southampton, or at least its StreamYard account. I'm your host, John Coxon, and today I'm drinking Conflux, which is a beer that tastes of beer, and people who have been to all three of these will know that that is not something I've done yet, so cheers. Let us know what you're drinking in the comments. Please also be tweeting. We have the hashtag Pint21 and we have the Twitter account at Pint of Science, as you can see down here in the corner. Uh, so do let us know what you think on Twitter. And please also be posting questions on the YouTube. Uh, we will be doing a Q&A with both our speakers at the end of the session where we will be posing your questions to our learned experts. So get your questions in early. First up tonight, we have David Chillingworth, who is a retired senior lecturer from the School of Mathematical Sciences at the University of Southampton. And he's interested in geometrical and topological ideas, and he's going to be applying those to gravitational lensing, cosmic illusions, and detecting the invisible. Take it away, David. Well, thank you very much. Uh but it's a great day. I'm not in a pub, and I don't happen to have a pint of beer with me, but I'm looking forward to one later on. So gravitational lensing, before I explain what that is, let me uh, start off with a rather more familiar uh, example of lensing. Here's a view through my bathroom window. Uh, now, as you can see, there are some trees and fences and things, but they're all somewhat distorted and bent. Uh, I've lost it again. Oh, hello. Right. Uh, and uh, But the, the, the distortions are various uh, different kinds. For example, if you look, uh, just a moment, I'm supposed to, yes, you see things that are straight, that should be straight, that look bent, that's one form of lensing. We'll call that weak lensing. But also you can see that there are places Oh, we should be able to see if which would uh, just come up. Yes, there are places where here is a piece of the tree that looks as if it's floating free from the rest of the tree. So it's actually an image that's broken up. So let's call that strong lensing. And lensing in this context just means the bending of the light rays due to some distorting medium, in this case, my bathroom window. And here's another example you're probably familiar with. It's a photo taken of sunlight shining through the stem and the base of a wine glass and it shows the kind of pattern produced, which is called the caustic, because if you do it with the sun's rays, uh, the places that are brightest are also pretty hot. You've probably done that with a dried leaf and a magnifying glass, or maybe your friend's arm in the junior school or something like that. So these are examples of uh, lensing, and there's the so-called caustic, caustic image. And my interest as a mathematician is in the geometry of those caustics, but we won't go into that. Now, here's a general setup. You have lensing when the dis light from a distant source comes through some distorting medium and it gets all mixed up. Now, what about the per person uh, who's the other side of the distorting medium? What do they actually see? Uh, see, they imagine an observer just sitting there, but according to my picture, I've had this, uh, not physically accurate, but just a little sketch. There are three rays of light going through that particular observer. So that means that that observer, following back those rays of light, thinks that there are three images of whatever it is they're supposed to be looking at. So the images are, are broken up. Well, now the question uh, that relates to this talk is gravity bending light. Can gravity bend light? Well, in the 17th century, uh, Newton in particular and others uh, were of the view that light consisted of little particles, corpuscles, and therefore gravity ought to be able to affect them. And uh, so, for example, the sun's gravity ought to be able to deflect light coming from a distant source. Uh, some calculations were made by various people. Henry Cavendish made a calculation apparently more or less on the back of an envelope, but nothing much uh, came of that. Somebody called Johann von Soldner from Germany did uh, more persistent calculations, and he figured out, using Newton's laws, that a light ray from a distant star passing close to the edge of the sun as we see it should be deflected by an angle of, 
well, 0.8 of a second, and a second is one three thousand six hundred of a degree, so it's a pretty small amount. But nevertheless, you should be able to measure it. And Einstein, a hundred years later, made his own calculation, and he arrived at uh, almost exactly the same value. And he encouraged astronomers to go and check it. Well, of course, one problem is if you're trying to measure the deflection in the light ray from a distant star close to the sun, the sun's rather bright, so you're really going to need a, a solar eclipse. So uh, expeditions were set up to find when the next solar eclipse came and to go and investigate. Well, an expedition went to Brazil in 1912, and uh, unfortunately it was rained off since Brazil's full of rainforest and not surprising. Another one went to the Crimea in 1914, but what happened in 1914? The First World War. So uh, the crew got arrested by Russian soldiers and not released after the eclipse. So that was a bit of a washout. And Einstein, however, recalculated in 1915, and he came up with twice the previous answer. So maybe it was just as well that the early expeditions didn't pursue their calculations. <clears throat> this was verified, this amount was verified by Arthur Eddington a bit later, and in fact, it's now uh, verified very accurately to within 0.02%. So Einstein's calculation was, was, was pretty good. Now, Einstein said that, well, of course, if, so, if a source is completely accurately lined up so that the source and the center of the sun and us are completely li in a straight line, then, in fact, everything is symmetrical about the, that, that, that axis, that central axis. So really, we should see a ring uh, of a distant object round the edge of whatever it is that's in the way, in this case, the sun, but maybe maybe uh, something else, maybe a distant star in the galaxy. But he said it's a bit of a crazy suggestion because there's not much chance of the three bodies being lined up precisely. So there's not much hope of observing this phenomenon directly. But 60 years later, with uh, the Hubble telescope and NASA, indeed, an Einstein ring was observed directly. There's an example of an Einstein ring. So there's a, a galaxy or galaxy well, a galaxy, relatively speaking, near to us and much farther away is uh, the blue ring is showing a distorted version of a distant galaxy. Now, usually things won't be lined up exactly, and uh, so the ring will be broken up and the ring, ring will break up into these uh, so-called luminous arcs. Now, some uh, astrophysicists in the United States did an experiment. They said, well, let's look at this Smithsonian Museum and uh, in Washington, D.C., and imagine that midway between us and the museum is a black hole, a small black hole, so I don't know how big it is, but uh, uh, pocket size, so to speak, but it's got the mass of Saturn, the mass of the planet Saturn, located between us and this building. What happens? This is the kind of thing that we'll see. This is the computer simulation to work out what would happen to the light rays, and to show us that uh, this is the sort of thing you would see. And you'll notice actually that the image is not quite broken up, but some of it's upside down, some of it's stretched greatly, it's squashed and stretched. Uh, so it's th th there are many different kinds of distortion going on in that picture. So that really gives an indication of what can happen. Now, the use of uh, gravitational lensing, it has many in uh, as a tool for detecting what's going on out there in the cosmos, only 4% of what's out there is uh, visible to us through light rays or X-rays or radio waves. Uh, uh, the rest of it is so-called dark matter. But we can tell it's there partly because it's matter, it's gravitational, and it uh, distorts light waves. So we can detect it's there because of its effect on distant uh, bodies. And you can see in this picture there are some of these arcs that show gravitational lensing is going on, but calculations show that in fact there's not enough mass visible in the picture with this galaxy cluster. To account for that lensing, there must be some dark matter around there as well. And indeed the uh, calculations uh, showed and simulation demonstrates what the dark matter would have to be like, what formation it would have to have in order to produce the gravitational lensing that the left-hand picture actually showed. So there, gravitational lensing is a tool for detecting dark matter, or detecting any matter for that matter. 
Now, uh, what about the large scale structure of the cosmos? <laughs> well, the, the way it's thought of nowadays is that uh, you have galaxy clusters and the galaxy clusters are uh, somehow connected by long filaments uh, of smaller galaxies, smaller numbers of galaxies, but we're talking about billions of light years width. So these are you know, large sizes we're talking about here. Uh, and the, the idea is that, that they're connected by these filaments largely consisting of dark matter. And the detection of these dark, this dark matter is uh, often carried out using gravitational lensing, using the lensing to detect that the uh, dark matter has got to be there, <coughs> even though we can't actually see it or detect it by the usual methods of uh, radio telescopes. So uh, people have <coughs> developed theoretical models to put a bit more structure on the large scale structure of the universe. And here's a, a simulation that comes from a team at Oxford to show how we think of the large scale, huge structure of the universe as consisting of all these galaxy clusters, but not just in a random distribution, but connected up by these, these filaments, uh, which are made up of billions of galaxies, and, of, of galaxies themselves. And so <clears throat> not only does the, the model, the theoretical models lead to this kind of conclusion, but evidence can be found to support this by using gravitational lensing as a tool for detecting gravity where we can't actually see anything that's producing the gravity. <clears throat> well, we've come from a, a bathroom window to the large scale cosmological structure of the universe. So that's quite a large uh, compass to accomplish in uh, one a short talk at, at the pint of science, but uh, never let it be said that we uh, we don't reach high. So thank you very much for your attention. And there, if you look closely at that pint, you can see a bit of lensing going on uh, through that glass. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> and thank you very much, David. Um, my my David, beer is um, too my, um, my beer opaque is to, for that to work, unfortunately, yes. but. Um, uh, but yeah, no, that was an excellent last picture. I liked that. Um, we have um, some comments in the chat with people saying what they're drinking. Um, and uh, people should keep tweeting with at Pint of Science or hashtag Pint21. Uh, but Alexandra um, tweeted or sorry, commented to say that she's drinking something which was once on a comet a very long time ago before crashing to Earth. And I think that she might be referring to water, um, but um, we shall see. Um, and Bob Kaplow makes a similar joke. It's early afternoon here in Chicago, Illinois, uh, and so nothing but dihydrogen monoxide to drink. Um, but Big Louie says that they're having a nice glass of red wine. So cheers to that. Brilliant stuff. OK, keep what you're drinking coming in on the comments and uh, keep the questions for David rolling in as well. We'll be taking questions at the end. Uh, but before we do, we've got another talk for you all now. And this is coming to you from Matthew Brown. Matthew is a final year PhD student at the University of Southampton, bridging the disciplines of atmospheric science and astronautics. But he also enjoys cycling, running and tending to way too many houseplants. Um, and he's going to be talking to us today about climate change in space and the impact of space debris. So take it away, Matthew. Thank you, John. So uh, just quickly, what I'm drinking is dark matter spice drum. I've only got the last bits of it, but it's very nice. So climate change in space and the impact on space debris. So this is going to be a talk uh, in two parts. So first of all, climate change in space, and then we'll be talking about the space debris, which is all the light bits. Uh, spiraling around the Earth. So first of all, space isn't a complete vacuum. So as we go up in altitude, the atmospheric density drops down, and it drops down really quickly to uh, about 100 kilometers, and then it uh, tails off a little bit more, but it keeps dropping as we go up in altitude. So then if we look at Everest, which is about eight kilometers in height, that is 50% less dense than it is at ground level. But then once we get up to the space station, it's a million, 1,000 million times less dense, or a million million, a million million times less dense. 
Um, and then we've got all of the other pieces of uh, space debris and satellites orbiting in that altitude range of around 300 kilometers to 500 kilometers. And there's stuff even above that where the atmosphere is a lot less thin, but we still think of that as space. So how does climate change in space work? So in the lower atmosphere, we have the greenhouse effect that lots of people know about. So CO2 absorbs energy, mostly from the sun. It then readmits it, and then it gets captured by all of the atoms and molecules which are in the lower atmosphere. And now the exact same effect happens in the higher atmosphere, so up in space, but it's much, much thinner. There's less molecules so on the right-hand side we have the upper atmosphere where that heat which is being released from the CO2 is escaping either to the lower atmosphere or out into space. And that means that as the heat escapes, the temperature drops. And a great way of thinking about this is as a solar powered heater inside a greenhouse. So you have the greenhouse effect when all of the panes of glass are there, but as soon as you break those panes of glass and the atmosphere becomes thinner, all of that heat escapes and the temperature drops inside the greenhouse. So what happens when that temperature drops? So here we have a balloon filled with just normal air. And as we cool it down, it decreases in volume and it contracts downwards and it takes up less volume. So as that happens throughout the atmosphere, up in the uh, higher atmosphere, we get contraction where? So we start out with a big atmosphere here. As it cools down, it takes up less and less volume. And that's what we have here. So we've got three different levels and they're all contracting downwards. And the darker it is, the less dense and the more space-like it is. And as you can see, that satellite there, oh, that mouse, yeah, cool. It's the exact same altitude above the Earth, but just from that contraction, it's ending up in a less dense region of space. So we've modeled this, and this is the first, uh, major graph if you like so we've had we've increased the carbon dioxide di carbon dioxide concentration at ground level from 360 370 parts per million which is what it was in the year 2000 and we've increased that up way over double that to 890 and this on the y-axis is the density drop at 400 kilometers so the space station altitude compared to the year 1000 and so at our current CO2 level, which is about 440 parts per million, I think, we already have a 21% drop in the atmospheric density at the space station's altitude. And if we match the 1.5 degrees Celsius target of the Paris Agreement, then that will be limited to around 30% um, or so. So the second part is space debris. So what is space debris? Space debris is all of the leftover junk that we've left in space from our use of it. So that's all of the dead satellites, all of the pieces that have come off the satellites. So say when we put a camera in space, there'll be a lens cap on it and we'll just drop that lens cap off and it will float away. Uh, on the space station, when some astronauts have been working on it, they've dropped a spanner and that's floated off and that's space debris. And then sometimes these satellites or pieces of space debris collide and they'll cause a lot more space debris as just like a car crash throws off lots more pieces everywhere. And if we think of a working satellite, so here we have a Lego mock-up of a Hubble satellite. Just like Lego, when you break it down, it'll end up in lots and lots of different pieces. So in the top left, we have all of the larger pieces and they're really easy to track. And then we have some of the medium sized pieces here. Um, so around 10 centimeters is the size that we're able to track easily. So we usually use a softball as a reference for that or a mobile phone. Ooh, there we go. Um, and they're about the sizes that we can track, which is really impressive considering they're 400 kilometers away. But anything smaller than that, so all of these things in the bottom, apart from the solar panels, um, all of those we can't track, but they're up there. And if they collide with anything, they'll still damage the satellite and we don't know what's happening with them. And as you can see, there's a lot fewer larger objects, but there's a lot, lot more of the smaller objects. And these things are traveling incredibly quickly around the earth. So here we have the uh, 
the Premier League, the Championship and League One, and all of the football pitches, if you line them up one by one in a massive row, which I couldn't do on this slide, sadly, so I've stacked them up, um, it will cover that distance in less than a second. These things are going phenomenally quickly, 10 times the speed of a bullet or around seven to eight kilometres per second. And that means that when they hit something, they'll just absolutely pulverise it and create masses of space debris. So then here we have the monthly number of objects in Earth orbit. And this is everything in Earth orbit. So if I quickly go back to this slide, yes. So the bit that we're most focused in is this lower region down here. So this is low Earth orbit. This is really close to the Earth where the density of space and the atmosphere is just enough that it's still causing a lot of atmospheric drag on all of the space debris. And then out here is the geostationary ring where because of how it matches up with the Earth, it will stay above the same point on the equator of the Earth as it travels around. And they're great for communications and stuff like that. So if we jump through again. So this is all of that debris. So it's everything, everything in low Earth orbit and all of the geostationary stuff. And this is from 1956 down here. So one object, um, Sputnik. Um, and then it's been building up slowly and slowly over time. And as you can see from these spikes, there we go. So these are anti-satellite missiles where they've blown up satellites on purpose or collisions in space where two satellites have collided with each other and caused a massive spike in the amount of space debris. And most of the stuff up there, so this pink line, is all of the fragments, all of the debris. And then this blue line here is the actual working spacecraft themselves. And as you can see, it's been fairly linear, slowly climbing upwards. And then all of a sudden, with the interesting uh, constellations, so like SpaceX and all of the smaller satellites that we're launching now, um, there's been a sudden tick up and an increase in that kind of usage of space. So now I'm going to try and join those two things together. So this bit's a bit graph heavy, so I'm sorry about that, but it's a great way of illustrating what's going to happen to the uh, debris environment. So on this slide, we have uh, CO2 concentration on the y-axis and the year on the um, x-axis. And what this is, is a projection of what CO2 could do into the future. So the intergovernmental, intergovernmental panel on climate change uh, released these four scenarios. So they're the same people who do the 1.5 degree uh, investigation. So the red line is the highest CO2. And that would be what would happen if we just kept on burning fossil fuels. Whereas the blue line, the one at the bottom here, that's what would happen if we stopped releasing lots of CO2 and we actually started removing it from space. And then we have the yellowy orange and the green line, which are in between. And at the moment, um, what we have committed to as all of the different nations is in between the orange and green line. So what we can do is we can then take those CO2 concentrations and the graph that I showed earlier where the atmospheric density changes with the CO2. And um, we can actually plug that into a debris model and see what happens to the debris environment. So on the left hand side, we have the exact same graph as the previous slide. And then on the right is what happens to the debris environment below 500 kilometers. So the bit we're interested in with atmospheric density and the impact from drag. And we have four different graphs related to the four different scenarios. And it's the same colors again. So the blue one, so this middle graph here, is the low CO2 scenario where there isn't much of an increase in debris. The orange is slightly above that. And then as we add more and more CO2, we get a bigger and bigger increase until red absolutely peaks up. Um, one thing to think about is that this trend from the CO2 isn't actually being modeled at the moment in graphs. So even though this looks like a small increase, it's actually about two times more debris than we would see in our usual debris model results. And as we increase the CO2, that gets worse and worse. So at the moment, these are all on the same scale. So they're all the same numbers. But then if we zoom in, especially on the two lower CO2 scenarios here, we can see we've got this kind of 
peak and trough system every 11 years or so. And what that is, is it's the solar activity. So the sun puts out more energy every 11 years and that heats up the atmosphere, increases the density, and that removes a lot of the space debris. But then as soon as it cools back down again, as the sun puts out less energy, then the debris can build up again. And one interesting thing is that as we put more and more CO2 into the atmosphere, we start losing that 11 year cycle. So all of a sudden these peaks and troughs start disappearing and that's where you get that sudden ramp up in the amount of debris. So that's also, thank you very much. And hopefully there's some great questions coming up. Thank you very much, Matthew. That was amazing. Uh, and um, as I say, keep tweeting at Point of Science and hashtag Point21. Um, for now, I'm going to invite uh, David back into the screen and we're going to answer some of your audience questions. Um, I'm going to, oh, yes. And if you'd like to follow Matt on Twitter, you can. He's Matt Kenny Brown. Uh, so do everyone go and follow him. Um, so, yeah, brilliant stuff. Um, so, um, I think David has stepped away from his computer, but I'm sure he will be back. So do we have any questions for Matthew? I think I see one from Alexandra. So maybe we'll answer that one first. OK, so Alexandra asks, how will the launch of constellations like SpaceX's Starlink change things? Like, will it make space debris worse? And like, how quickly do you think that effect will be felt if there is one? So that's... Um... An interesting thing that we're hoping to research exactly but what they're doing is they're sending up lots and lots of spacecraft and they're building up to thousands of spacecraft over the next decade or two so it's going to slowly ramp up and they're saying that they um they're putting them in the lower orbits so they'll quickly remove themselves from um from orbit if anything does go wrong and if nothing does go wrong, then they'll be able to avoid all of the debris. Um, but if something does go wrong, they can still collide with the debris. So there might still be a problem. And we don't know how many of their satellites are going to go wrong yet. So it could quickly start ramping up. We don't know how bad it will be until, say, a decade's time. OK, fair enough. Thank you very much. Um, and then, hello, David. Um, so keep those questions coming in. We have a question for Hello. David. Um, so uh, the question is, is it only, black, here, holes? only black holes can produce gravitational lensing or any object with enough mass? Well, the answer is any object with any object with enough mass. Uh, but of course, the smaller the object, the less the effect. I mean, one example of gravitational lensing was the detection of the bending of light from a distant star by the sun. Uh, as Einstein had predicted, and as Eddington uh, verified, the solar eclipse. But that was an extremely small amount. Uh, I don't know if I'm still connecting or not. I think we can still hear you. But, uh, of course, if you have a black hole or uh, an extremely massive galaxy or galaxy cluster, then the gravitational effect of that will be so large that it will produce gravitational lensing large enough for us to observe. So the answer is that any gravity will produce gravitational lensing, but in order to produce enough for us to see and uh, do something sensible with and interpret, uh, you need something of a very large mass. But it doesn't have to be a black hole. It could be a galaxy, which is, of course, pretty large, but uh, not as large as some of the things that are out there. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, we've got another question from Lucas, uh, and they ask, why does the sun stop having an effect on lower orbit space debris as CO2 levels in the lower atmosphere increase? That is a so question for Matt. Yes, I, I suspect so, yes. So um, the amount of density decrease depends on how much energy the sun is putting out. So when stop having an effect on lower space So as we put more CO2 into the atmosphere, 
the lower atmosphere decreases in density, which then means that there's less drag on the space debris, which then means that not as much is removed over time. So that means that the numbers can ramp up a lot quicker. And it's all connected into the CO2. So more CO2, bigger density decrease, more debris. Okie dokie. Brilliant stuff. Thank you. Um, oh, excuse me. Um, there's a question for David, which is, why did it take so long for gravitational lensing to be observed? Well, why did it take so long for gravitational lensing to be observed? Uh, it's an interesting question. Uh, in, in a way, the answer is, uh, well, they just didn't notice it. But, um, yeah, the history is rather curious because Einstein had predicted it, and quite a number of astronomers developed the ideas until about 1930, and then everything went quiet for another 30 years. And nobody really took it very seriously. In fact, it was a bit controversial. Uh, and it wasn't really until, well, it was 1979 when the first uh, Einstein ring was actually uh, detected. And before that, people had seen various phenomena which they thought were anomalous in the past, but didn't give them much attention. But when gravitational lensing became uh, a thing, once again, people started looking back at their previous data and realizing that, oh, I see, so that's what it was. It was a, it was gravitational lensing taking place. So the answer really is a cultural one. There was no, uh, uh, well, partly a cultural one, but also, of course, uh, a big feature in more recent years is with the Hubble telescope, we've been able to see much further than we ever could before and a much larger number of distance objects and with the increased um, technology enabling us to scan the huge number of items in the sky much more effectively, uh, it's been possible to detect uh, lensing in, in all over the place, you might say. But it's an example of something that if you're not looking for it, then you don't see it. Thank you very much. Um, we've got a, another question, I think, from Liviu. Uh, uh, this is a question for Matt. Um, great presentation. Space debris seems to become an awful problem. Is there any research towards using less mechanical methods for removing space debris, like anything other than burning them in atmosphere? So at the moment, basically all of the debris is just burnt up in the atmosphere, and that's the only natural way that they're removed from the environment unless you fire them out deep into space like uh, Elon Musk did with the Tesla a few years ago. But... Um, there is some research to try and find out how to capture them and remove them from orbit more quickly. So last year there was um, removed debris which had a harpoon on it and it fired that into a piece of its own debris that it carried up with it and then captured it. And it also tried a net um, to wrap itself around the debris and bring it in. And there's lots of all these um, kinds of research satellites being sent up to explore those different means of capturing debris and to bring it down faster. But everything does ultimately end up being burnt in the atmosphere. Um, there is some really far out research, which is trying to look at um, how to recycle debris within space. So that will capture the satellite and then it will take the fuel away from it and pump that into another satellite. But that is uh, many decades off yet. But it is something that is starting to be thought about. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, so we have a question from Roshanna, um, and this one's for David. What do you need to see this gravitational lensing? Well, I think the simple answer to that is a, a powerful telescope. Of course, if the telescope is above the atmosphere, like the uh, NASA uh, the Hubble telescope, then you're much in a much better position. But basically, you need a powerful telescope because... The most uh, spectacular gravitational lensing is uh, caused by galaxies and galaxy clusters, which are a huge distance away from us, and they are lensing the light, which is coming from maybe a, a quasar or another galaxy cluster, which is an even more huge distance away from us. So you have to be able to have telescopes that are powerful enough to penetrate quite far into the universe to pick up enough examples of gravitational lensing. But even before the days of Hubble, as I was saying earlier, people had seen examples of, well, what they thought were rather peculiar phenomena, 
and uh, we now realize were examples of gravitational lensing, even with uh, Earth-bound uh, terrestrial optical telescopes. But you would have a hard job to see it uh, just looking at the sky with a pair of binoculars. Thank you very much. And a question from Alan, um, and this one's from Matthew. Uh, why did space debris suddenly jump around 2006? So there was a big spike in 2009, which is probably the one you're talking about. And what happened there was there was a, a working satellite, Iridium-33, um, about the size of a car, which collided with a dead Russian satellite. So that was about the size of a car as well. And those two collided, and they were in a really high orbit um so they hit each other created lots of debris and then because they were in a high orbit there wasn't much atmospheric density there so there wasn't much drag to remove that debris so that stayed up there for years and years and it keeps on causing um possible collisions to this day and different conjunctions is what they're called yeah the iridium constellation is the one i use for my research um and it is uh one of the pictures i use in my talks is a, an image of the debris cloud afterwards and it's huge yeah um so yeah it's uh and it a starts whole thing. quite um compact like it will send out mm. a spray in both of the satellites directions but over time so over years that those two things spread out and they start covering the whole shell of the orbit no it's uh it's amazing it's um i mean not amazing in a good way but definitely no. amazing <laughs> um thank you very much um super interesting um jay has a question which is uh, for david which is do you know how how do you know how many false images you will get well, uh, that's where the mathematics comes in. In fact, my interest in this subject comes from the mathematical rather than the cosmological direction. Uh, if you have a caustic such as the one uh, that I showed near the beginning of the light shining through a wine glass stem uh, and base, uh, you can see the form of the caustic. It has these various cusped corners and so on. And from that, you can work out what the light rays are doing and calculate how many right rays are going through a typical point in each particular region demarcated by the caustic. And uh, that allows you to, yeah, to work out how many false images you will get. Now, with the uh, examples in, uh, the, in the cosmos, uh, there are similar calculations that people do. In fact, there's quite a body of mathematics devoted towards exactly that uh, calculation as to you know, how do you detect from the data that you do have, how many images you can expect to get. And in some cases, uh, there are very many images. There are examples of those uh, luminous arcs that were in a couple of the pictures which I showed, where if you look carefully, apparently you can find up to 120 luminous arcs in uh, one particular example. You could probably only see about four or five of them clearly. <laughs> but uh, the answer is, how do you know is, well, if you have a good mathematical model, there are formulae which will enable you to work it out. But of course, it's quite difficult to make sure if you're, to, to, to be sure if your mathematical model for what's going on is actually what you're seeing out there in, in space. So you just have to look as many, gather as many clues as you can find and uh, feed that into the mathematics and that will give you some answers. Thank you very much. That was super interesting. Um, we've got a question for Matthew from Liviu. Um, can one think of pushing debris further from Earth? So that is a possible solution. Um, but you have to think about what would happen if eventually many centuries, many millennia down the road, it ended up colliding with, say, Mars or somewhere where we were interested in doing science. Um, what would happen then? Um, so it's definitely possible. Um, one thing that is being looked into is using lasers. So ground-based lasers, which shoot lasers straight at debris and then push it off. And um, at the moment, that isn't being looked at pushing them further from Earth, but it's pushing them just enough so that they avoid other pieces of debris, which they are about to collide with. 
Cool, thank you very much. That's brilliant. Um, Lviv has a question for David as well, which is, a gravitational lens is a fascinating notion. Is it too far-fetched to think of lens in lens in lens? Well, uh, I'm not quite sure what you mean by the lens in the lens, but certainly it's uh, you can have the following situation that if you go back to my uh, original picture of a um, of the bathroom window, if you think of the bathroom window or part of it as being uh, a galaxy, and then you think of the trees in the neighbor's garden as being a galaxy cluster or quasar or uh, some very luminous object in a much more distant galaxy, uh, you could say, well, let's suppose there was not just one bathroom window, but suppose there were several bathroom windows between us and the luminous object. Then not only would you get the first lot of distortion, but then that would come to and you'll get another lot and that would come to and you'll get another lot. And that is indeed uh, what happens. And people do study the mathematics of uh, multiple lenses, one after the other in succession. And indeed, you can get some quite bizarre phenomena arising in that way. So the answer is no, it's not too far-fetched. Indeed, it's it's what happens under certain circumstances. Cool, thank you very much. That's uh, the idea of kind of lining up a bunch of gravitational lenses. Seems like it could be the plot of some sort of movie <laughs> in which you manipulate an ancient temple to get the planets to align or something. Um, but perhaps I'm just, uh, I've, I've seen too many pulp movies. Yeah, um, well, manipulating them wouldn't be easy. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, we have another question from Alexandra. Um, this one's from Matthew. How fast do satellites orbit and travel? And is there a limit for this speed? And does space debris travel at the same speed? So quite contradictory to what most people think, the lower down the satellite or the piece of space debris is to the Earth, the faster it travels. Because what it needs to do is as it orbits around the Earth, it needs to travel fast enough that way to avoid falling down into the Earth. So that means it needs to travel really quickly that way, whereas if it's farther out here, it can travel a lot more slowly. So down here, closer to the Earth, it's about eight to nine kilometres per second. And then as you go out farther and farther, I can't remember the, um, the speed of the geostationary satellites, but it's noticeably slower. Yeah, so... A uh, satellite in low Earth orbit will order in like a hundred or so minutes, whereas in geostationary orbit, obviously you're going around once every 24 hours. Yeah. So like it is much slower. That's um, a good way of thinking of it. Jay asks, David, do you have any more pictures? They were really cool. Uh, yes. Well, there are a couple more pictures uh, which I uh, I don't know. I can put them up if you, if you wait Ooh. a second. Here they are. I think this is is this them. I think this is yeah, that, that, that's them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, so if you want to look at pictures, uh, you if you go to the NASA website, they've got a large number of pictures, and you can look for that so-called castles group, uh, and they have a whole uh, inventory of lensing phenomena. Uh, so, and you just, I mean, if you just Google gravitational lens images, you will get uh, huge numbers of them. But uh, there are a couple of bizarre ones I thought it's worth picking out here. There's this one here, there's this kind of smiley face. You see, there's a, there's a couple of galaxies uh, in the middle. And then there, there are these blue bits of blue ring around uh, the outside, which are uh, these uh, giant luminous arcs. And there's another one over on the right, which looks a bit more menacing. You can't see it very clearly, but it, it looks a bit like a some kind of spacecraft with twin headlights or, or, I don't know, some kind of alien insect. I don't know what it is exactly, but it's another example of a rather uh, strange gravitational lensing phenomenon. But you can see those and uh, very many more on, on the NASA website and the, uh, the Castle's website. With the smiley face, can I ask if the actual smile of it is part of the lensing, or is it um, a different galaxy? Uh, no, I think it's part of the lensing. Yeah, yeah. It's, right. it, 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 if if you had a single, if you had a single galaxy and a signal and a single luminous source, single luminous source lined up 
perfectly behind it, then as Einstein predicted, you would get a, a ring. Well, of course, right. it's lined up perfectly, so you don't get a perfect ring. And in any case, we've got two objects here, so that's breaking it up again. But yeah, all that all that blue stuff, that's all part of the, the lensed image. Awesome, thank you very much. Those are amazing images. Um, that's so cool. Um, we have another question from Alexandra. Um, Matthew mentioned the atmosphere expands and contracts. Does that mean that the ISS orbits at different parts of the atmosphere with changing temperatures? So, yes. So, um, it slightly changes in altitude from about 415 kilometers to about 400. It's a very small change. Um, but it always boosts itself up. So, it's got some little rockets on it that will fire to increase its altitude again. Um, so it changes slightly in height, but most of the density change that it experiences is due to um, the atmosphere expanding and contracting as the sun puts out more and less solar energy. Excellent stuff. Thank you very much. That is that is kind of amazing. Um, Pinky Purple Galaxy says, wow, um, which is excellent. Um, Alexandra asks, this might just show how little I know, but David showed some photos of a university with an imaginary black hole in front of it, and there was no black. Are black holes actually black? Thinky emoji. Well, black holes are black in the sense that the light which uh, would uh, come to us from them if there weren't any uh, gets hauled back by the gravity of the black hole because the gravity is so strong, so the light can't get away. So it looks to us like black because we're not receiving any light from it. <clears throat> but in this particular uh, illustration with the, uh, this computer simulation of the, the photo, well, the actual black, so-called black hole, first of all, of course, it didn't exist. It's a computer simulation, so they don't need to put anything there if they don't want. And secondly, even though the black hole was uh, assumed from the point of view of this simulation, assumed to have the same mass as the planet Saturn, uh, since the gravitational attraction of black holes is so strong, the black hole itself would have to be really small. Now, I'm not a cosmologist, and uh, I haven't yet uh, figured out the answer. Maybe some of you others know what size a black hole would have to be in order to have the gravitational attraction of the planet Saturn. But I think the answer is it would have to be pretty small. So if it would, if it were just an object, uh, not exerting gravity, you probably wouldn't even notice it if it was uh, there between you and the, and the building. That's really interesting. Thank you. I hadn't, uh, hadn't really considered that. I don't think. Would there um, be a process to create a black hole that big? Well, that small. Sorry, say it again. Would there be a process to create a black hole that small? Because most of the time it starts collapsing, whereas if it's Saturn... Yeah, well, I don't know. I don't know if you remember when the, uh, the Large Hadron Collider was about to do its big experiment to detect the Higgs boson, whatever they were doing. And um, there was some controversy in the press as to whether they might inadvertently create a black hole which would swallow up the whole of CERN and the whole of Switzerland and maybe the whole of the Earth. Who, who knows? But fortunately, um, people said, well, there's no need to worry because Stephen Hawking, the famous mathematician and cosmologist, Stephen Hawking approved a theorem which said that uh, black holes uh, wouldn't do that. And it, if a black hole were created in CERN, in the Large Hadron Collider, then it would be so small that it would evaporate and disappear before it did any harm. Well, that may be reassuring. It's nice to think that the whole future of the human race depended on Stephen Hawking's theorem being correct, but it appears that he was correct and there was no danger from black holes. But, um, uh, yeah, whether you could, whether physically a small black hole of that appropriate size would exist, I'm afraid I'm not qualified to answer fair enough thank you very much um oh we've got a question from the talkie toaster how practical would it be for us to clean up the space debris or should we just wait for the sun to sweep it away for us so um 
in the lower regions of space, so about below 800 kilometers, it would be feasible for the sun to clear all of it away over time. Um, but above that, we'd have to do it ourselves, which we'd have to launch more satellites to go and collect the satellites to bring them down. That means launching more satellites, which could go wrong. Um, and then also it's known as a super wicked problem where the people who need to solve the problem and put money into solving the problem are the people who were causing the problem originally. So say NASA launches a satellite, it's going to have to be NASA who goes up and collects that satellite and brings it down, which uh, almost doubles the price, basically, because you're launching two satellites instead of just the one. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> we've probably got time for a couple more questions. So Pinky Purple Galaxy asks, what are the limits of experimenting on Earth before it's too dangerous to try? Um, and they say that that's for whoever would like to answer. So I think it's for both black holes and for space debris. Quite after you. I need to. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things we say on our grant, I work in um, space physics, and one of the things we say on our grant applications is that by spend, sending spacecraft into space, we're using the largest natural laboratory we have access to, which is the kind of Earth environment. Um, and so I think I think that's one reason that we go outside of experimenting on Earth is we, we get access to extreme um, extreme manifestations of physics that are uh, beyond our ability to recreate on our planet. Um, yeah. So that's definitely kind of one rationale for doing experiments outside Earth. So one thing which would tie the two subjects together would be uh, the telescope satellites, so like Hubble, where we put it above the atmosphere, so into space, so that we don't have to look through the atmosphere to actually capture the images of the gravitational lensing. So when we put it on the ground, we are limited by the actual atmosphere itself. And there are ways to remove that, but it's not as good as if we just put it straight up there. Maybe Matt can answer this question from me. Uh, to what extent has the Hubble telescope been damaged by space debris? Ah, so when we sent um, astronauts up to fix it originally because of the problem with the lens, they took a few of the um, outside panels away and brought them back to Earth. And that had loads of little tiny micrometeorite impacts on it, which I'm not sure whether they were from external meteorites or actually from space debris. So these were absolutely tiny things um, just dotted all over the panelling. Um, Hubble got pretty lucky with that, where it was just those tiny dots, but some other satellites. So um, what is it? I think it was Sentinel-1A. Um, its solar panel heading off to one side was hit by a fairly large piece of debris. So it was only about one centimeter in size, but that left an impact hole on the um, solar panel about that size. And it damaged the solar panel. So it was creating less energy. It imparted enough momentum on the satellite that it started actually rotating it. So then the antenna wasn't pointing at the ground. So then they lost communication with the satellite. And yeah, a multi-million pound satellite from just a tiny <laughs> piece of debris was suddenly at risk of being lost completely. Cool. Thank you very much. That is brilliant. Um, okay, I think we've got time for one more question because it's five to nine. Um, I see we've got a new commenter, um, so hopefully we can get their question up on screen. Um, oh, Pint of Science UK, new commenter. What about your T-shirt, Matt? What is it? I actually ordered a Point of Science one, but I, I ordered it too late to arrive. So this is just like some flowers. Oh, excellent. It's it's very nice, very nice shirt. Um, and Thank we've you. got a we've got a question from a Parometer who asks, um, is there do, 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 that? Is there a belt of debris around the Earth? But also, do missions like the recent Mars mission from NASA need to take account of that debris? 
So, first of all, is there a belt of debris? Yes. So there's two belts of debris that people are most interested in. So there's one at 800 kilometers, which is a result of that big collision between the Iridium satellite and the Cosmos satellite. And then there's also one at 1,200 kilometers, which used to be used by a lot of satellites, but there wasn't enough atmospheric density to clear that out. So that's just built up over time. Um, and when we launch satellites past those regions, so out through them, whether it's to the moon, to Mars, anywhere else, um, at the moment, most of the time, it's just pop luck and sending it through and hoping that nothing collides with it. But it's starting to become more and more um, built into the mission itself. So it'll wait to make sure that it's got a clear path and there's not a um, any debris approaching within, say, 50 kilometers, I think, is the difference between them. So they try and wait for a hole in the debris. Nice. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, and we have a comment from Pinky Purple Galaxy. Wow. Which is pretty much a good summary of the evening, I think. Um, so thank you both uh, for speaking to us today. Um, I think everyone really enjoyed it. We got a lot of questions, which is super great. Um, thank you to everyone who's watching right now for coming along. And thank you to everyone who's watching on replay. We like you too. Hope you're enjoying and have enjoyed this video. Um, I have been John Coxon, and uh, I'd like to thank everyone in the back room. Um, so Sarah, Oana, Marie, Alba, Sam, uh, Jay, and everyone else who makes Point of Science so brilliant. I'd like to thank Matthew and David today, as well as the speakers from the other two days who were amazing. And I'd like to thank everyone who's asked questions and watched along. Uh, it has been fantastic. And um, thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Thanks for listening. Thank you.